Well, good morning, everybody. I was thinking this morning about thankfulness. We've got Thanksgiving coming up this week and how thankful uh, I am for you. So many faithful people in this class that just keep coming and coming and you're here. Uh, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 5. That's where we are. So let's begin our lesson. Charles Haddon Spurgeon is known as the Prince of Preachers. I think I can safely say that over the years, uh, Spurgeon has been quoted from the pulpit of Believer's Chapel uh, more than any other preacher outside of a certain one that preached a few years ago here at our church. And if you've been attending here for long, you know that remarkably, he began his half-century uh, ministry in London at the age of 20 years old. It's, am it's amazing to, to think that. With a sermon on knowing God, arguing simply that the proper study of God's elect is God. The highest science, he said, the loftiest speculation, the mightiest philosophy which can ever engage the attention of a child of God is the name, the nature, the person, the work, the doings, and the existence of the great God whom he calls his Father. And as we arrive at the, really, the middle section of the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Luke, we find the Lord Jesus encountering two badly afflicted individuals with hopeless conditions, a, a leper and a paralytic. And Jesus' response to each informs us in similar ways something most important about God, that he is compassionate. Compassion uh, is the loveliest of words because it communicates that we need not endure the various difficulties that beset us alone. Compassion is the solace of another joining with us in our suffering, of one who can identify with our experience because, because of his own similar experiences. It's what the word itself means, compassion, to suffer with, to feel with. And applied to God, we can say he has shown compassion for his own preeminently in the incarnation by sending his son to take on a human nature and real human flesh and to hence identify himself with us as no other could. And that's one of the main arguments uh, of the epistle to the Hebrews, if you remember, in his second chapter, uh, borrowing from Psalm 8 and the psalmist's awe at the dignity of man made in God's image, but now marred by man's sin. In relief, the author rejoices that we do see him, uh, namely Jesus, uh, not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters because it allowed him to be our great high priest, representing us as a true man. And that's what he meant when he said in verse 18, of Hebrews chapter 2, for since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. And then doubling down in the fourth chapter of Hebrews, since we have him as our great high priest, we ought to hold fast in that we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. So here in chapter 5, we see Luke describe two consecutive encounters early in Jesus' ministry. We'll examine the first today, and then the second, Lord willing, in our next lesson. First, he comes across a leper and cleanses him, illustrating the filth of man's sin and our need for cleansing. Then he will meet up with a paralytic and restore him to health in the process underscoring our total inability. 
So let's read it. We're going to read verses 12 through 16. While he was in one of the cities, behold, there was a man covered with leprosy. Luke had a habit of not telling us where this incident occurred. He had his own uh, motivations in, in writing his gospel. We don't know where it is or when it happened, but both Matthew and Mark record it, so we know uh, this was very important to the early church. But here was this man covered with leprosy, and when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And he stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he ordered him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, just as Moses commanded, as a testimony to them. But the news about him was spreading even farther, and large crowds were gathering to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. Well, for most of us, uh, leprosy is uh, the, this horrible disease that we read about in the Bible. That's what leprosy uh, is. It's not a malady uh, commonly met with in our own world. It is often, though not accurately, associated with modern forms of Hansen's disease. But it appears in the Bible as representative of a variety of serious infections of the skin, which in its worst forms is a terrible affliction leading to rotting flesh, festering sores, and even deformity of the limbs and the face. In the first century, leprosy was an especially abhorrent illness and one that obtained a social stigma. Uh, lepers were considered unclean and highly contagious and thus were also severely alienated from the rest of society. The formal consequences uh, for a leper, like the one in our passage we just read, are provided in Leviticus 13.45, where it is prescribed that his clothes shall be torn, and the hair of his head shall be uncovered, and he shall cover his mustache and cry out, unclean, unclean. At the time of Jesus, the rabbis, uh, the spiritual leaders, uh, the the uh, experts in the law, the rabbis traced the disease to moral causes and believed the leper to be not only sanitarily unclean, but also morally unclean. He was required upon approaching a non-leprous person to not only cry out the obligatory unclean, unclean, but also to maneuver to ensure uh, what we would call today social uh, distancing, uh, to make sure that he didn't come into contact with anyone who was not a leper. Uh, offenders often had stones thrown at them. They were not allowed to buy bread on the street. The 14th chapter of Leviticus lays out the Mosaic Law's instructions for the ritual cleaning of a leper, not I hasten to add, not how a leper could actually be made clean, but how one who had somehow been cleaned could be ceremonially declared to be clean. And I say this because it explains why after Jesus heals the man, he tells him in verse 14 to go and show himself to the priest and offer what Moses commanded for his cleansing. He was to present two live birds. Uh, one would be killed and its blood uh, splattered, sprinkled on uh, the leprous, formerly leprous person uh, seven times, and the other bird was to be set free. And the result was that he would be pronounced uh, clean and he would rejoin the community. What a, what a blessing that had to have been to rejoin uh, the rest of the world. 
And in this way, though, it foreshadowed what Christ accomplished by the shedding of his own blood, uh, reconciling sinners to God and bringing them into the fellowship and communion of the family of God. In our case here, Jesus desired that the man receive that official recognition of what he had done for him because the disease of leprosy was generally thought to be a parable for what sin is, especially symbolic of it, and the deliverance from it, a, a picture for us of release from our sins. The Old Testament rituals, I know you're familiar with them because you read through the Bible every year, but the Old Testament rituals laid great emphasis on what was clean and what was unclean, and leprosy, uh, next to the defilement one might bring upon himself by touching a dead body, was foremost among the scriptural code of defilements. Therefore, we can say, as Kent Hughes has written, the leper is a physical illustration of ourselves apart from the cleansing work of Christ. Sin has invaded all our faculties. Sin's leprosy uh, runs from the soles of our feet to the crown of our head so that we are totally unclean. Apart from the work of Christ, we are dead long before we take our last breath. We are dead in the leprosy of our trespasses and sins, seeking to cover our wounds with pathetic disguises made to hide our true condition. It started with Adam and Eve, their pathetic attempt to hide. Well, this man, Luke, uh, tells us in verse 12, was covered with lep leprosy. Uh, Luke, our physician author, adds that observation to what Matthew and Mark describe more plainly, but what it means is he had an advanced uh, case. And so as he comes to Jesus, we, we can picture uh, the pitifulness of the scene and how, how it must have affected uh, those who, who saw him. He was a gross figure, uh, gruesome to look at and repulsive. And that would have made it all the more alarming when he approached Jesus so closely, especially in view of the scriptural injunctions from Leviticus that the leper was to dwell alone apart from society and make his habitation outside the, the, the camp the leper would have fled from before a rabbi, but in contrast, empowered by his desperate lowliness, he ventured forward to this man whose reputation had spread even to the leper's abode. There was something about Jesus always that was invariably welcoming to the downtrodden. They found him. And when he saw Jesus, you see there in the text, he fell down before him on his face. And his appeal, you'll notice, was not so much to be healed, but rather to be cleansed, to be made clean. If one thing stood out about leprosy, it was its terrible filth. And for him to be healed, he had to be cleansed. And so his appeal indicated he believed in the ability that Jesus had to heal him. Of, of that he was sure, but of his willingness to make him clean, he was not sure. He said, Lord, if you are willing, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus quickly responded in verse 13. He stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed and immediately the leprosy left him. Mark adds in his gospel that at the sight of the poor man's approach to him, Jesus was moved with compassion. That's the phrase in my translation. He was moved with compassion. Mark utilizing there a Greek phrase expressing the wrenching of one's in the inward Parts and emotion so strong it, it affects one physically. It recalls 
the language of Hebrews 4 that I cited at the beginning. We have one who can sympathize with our weaknesses. Compassion and sympathy are twin expressions of a genuine love uh, for another. Jesus' disciples, they, they lived an adventuresome life. Uh, there they were standing alongside him. They, 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 they would have been joltingly aware of, of that. Uh, seeing their master extend his hand to touch a leper. The, a human touch. Something the leper had not uh, felt for years and years and years, but one illustrating the depth of the love of Jesus Christ for sinners. To reach out his hand and touch the sin, to touch the corruption. For here was a man, if you think about it, removing the barrier uh, separating the unclean from the one supremely clean. By touching him, Jesus identified himself with him, uh, providing for us a, a living parable of the Son of God's entire mission of salvation, uh, reaching out in his incarnation uh, to take our sins upon himself and infuse us with a healing we could never have obtained on our own. In the words of the Apostle Paul, you know it in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And the physical image of Jesus stretching out his hand uh, recalls how God in salvation history continually stretched out his hand to accomplish his mighty acts. I am willing, he responded. In that one brief utterance, I am willing, expressing his complete sovereignty over any power that would oppose him or attempt to deny him in any way. At that moment, as William Hendrickson observed, Jesus' compassion and power embraced each other. And Luke tells us immediately the leprosy left him. One, one moment, the man was full of leprosy. The next moment, not a speck of the disease was left. That is not a natural thing. Some of us may wish there was something we could do so that immediately the hair would grow back, perhaps return to its original color, the skin turn smooth again, the muscles no longer ache, the perfect vision return. But the natural thing we sadly discover is the opposite thing. In like manner, what Jesus does in the life of sinners in, in a split second of belief is not a natural thing, but supernatural. The moment you believe is how Dan often characterizes it. Immediately, our salvation is made real, our sins forgiven, and we're made spiritually whole. Jesus saw the leper, he had compassion on him, and he healed him. Later in verse 22 of chapter 7, you're going to recall this, this scene. Some disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus. They wanted to find out from him, uh, are you the expected one? Remember? Are you the expected one? Or were they content to continue to wait for Messiah to come? And his answer was prompt, Jesus was. He said, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed. They, they ought to have known that in Jesus, the promises of the Messianic age had been fulfilled. It was a common understanding of the Jews at the time that only God could heal a leper, and this man was unmistakably healed. 
Not only that, but the act of Jesus reaching out and making physical contact with this ritually unclean man was a statement in itself that the ceremonial regulations of the Mosaic law, which prohibited such an action, had their place up to a point, but when circumstances like this one arose demanding love and, and compassion, grace and mercy trumped those. But in that moment, Jesus preferred, in that moment, at that time, uh, Jesus preferred that his status as Messiah be, be contained to a small number. So in verse 14, he ordered the former leper to tell no one, let go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, just as Moses commanded as a testimony to them. That was a difficult uh, command, for it would have been only natural for the newly cleansed man to raise to show everyone. Everyone. Uh, but the Lord had already witnessed the response of the people in the Galilean countryside to his miraculous works. Their excitement could not be contained, and they threatened a popular movement around him. And so he knew what the news of the healings of the healing would generate. So instead, instead Jesus instructed this former leper uh, to leave and undergo the ritual for such a cleansing outlined in the Mosaic law, uh, presenting himself to the priest in the temple who served in the capacity of a kind of health inspector and who would examine him uh, to verify his cleansing so that he could be also restored to the full public and religious acceptance he had not known before, and we've described that script, sacrificial ritual already. Remember, our Lord was careful to submit himself to all that the law commanded. Uh, just as with his baptism, remember, go back, uh, he considered it fitting to fulfill all righteousness. And so he desired the man to follow uh, the same example. But here, Jesus adds a, a pointed remark at the end of verse 14. Uh, in subjecting himself to the ritual and revealing his miraculous healing, this man would serve as a testimony to them. What did he mean? This will be a testimony to them. Well, surely what that was was twofold. Uh, first, it would be a testimony to people in general that the touch of Jesus carried with it the power of God. But more specifically, it would be an irrefutable testimony to the increasingly hostile and skeptical Jewish leaders that he was no ordinary religious usurper, but he possessed the attributes always known to be the prerogatives of Messiah. They would not accept it, but they could do nothing to deny it. There was a rhythm to Jesus' public ministry. There was a rhythm to it, which only he was aware of. And this testimony was in harmony with the path he had set upon. And so this mechanical rite of cleansing in the temple would be enough testimony for the moment in the rhythm of his ministry. Well, whether the man followed that specific direction or not, and I, I suspect that he gladly did, uh, there had been enough spectators to the healing that the news quickly spread. And we know from Mark's account in Mark 1.45 that the former leper did in fact ignore uh, Jesus' command to keep his mouth shut. Instead, 
according to this passage in Mark, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer enter a city but stayed out in unpopulated areas. And Luke himself advises us of the same thing in verse 15, that the response of the Galilean population was growing. Uh, large crowds were gathering to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. Jesus' acclaim was steadily mounting. He was a miracle worker. Well, Luke draws his account to a close in verse 16 with an important side note. But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. This is the picture of Jesus we often see in Luke's gospel. Uh, he makes mention of Jesus' habit of prayer more often than the other gospel writers. People have speculated why. Certainly Matthew mentions him in prayer. Luke mentions, Mark, Luke mentions him in prayer. But Luke more, demonstrably more. Why that is, I don't think we can say for sure. I have a theory. You know, whenever the teacher says he has a theory, that should raise a red flag. <laughs> but I do have a theory. Uh, Luke's occupation was medicine. Uh, the practice of diagnosing and treating the physical infirmities with which human beings are afflicted. His focus was the human body, how it works, and what one can do when it shows symptoms of breakdown and submission to the effects of sin in our sinful world. Such empirical knowledge uh, moved Luke not to the abandonment of the spiritual, but to a greater wonder at the spiritual underpinnings of disease and human life. He was a disciple of Jesus Christ and understood perhaps more than others the mysterious power with which the Lord worked miracles that were unexplainable by natural causes. So he took greater note of Jesus' life of prayer, discovering in it the, the secret to Jesus' power. No matter how busy he was or how pressed upon he was by the demands of others, the mainstream of Jesus' life was his private communion with his Father in heaven. Time and again in the, in the Gospels, uh, Jesus is portrayed as forging out time for prayer no matter the circumstances of the moment. And Luke was in awe of it. And I think... Uh, desired the readers of his gospel to take special note of it as well. In other words, that you and I take special note of it because he mentions it more than the others. If the Lord Jesus Christ, in his majestic human condition and his impeccably sinless life, showed a passion for prayer above all else, then how much more ought we sinfully flawed mortals flee to that same communion with God. In the midst of our busyness, I know you're busy. That's our favorite term, isn't it? <laughs> busy. How are you busy? I'm busy. Uh, in the midst of your uh, busyness, or your turmoil, or our afflictions, or simply our lack of faith, Luke would have us look to Christ and know the urgency of taking time to be alone with God in prayer. Every single one of us know how difficult that is. Dan preaches about it all the time. We know it. It's difficult. And sometimes it's dry. That's our problem. It was John Bunyan who offered this axiom on the necessity of prayer. He said, you can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. So 
But here is, is the, the broader lesson, a broader lesson uh, that this scene offers. It is the blessing from God every believer has received because Jesus Christ stretched out his hand and touched us. At a moment in time, you may not be able to identify it. Many of you can identify it precisely. But at a moment in time, Jesus Christ stretched out his hand and he touched us. Because like the lepers of old, we are unclean. Our sin has contaminated our heart and made it foul and grotesque. And that's the first step in finding cleansing in Jesus. It is to recognize and admit the bankruptcy of our souls and that we are beggars with nothing to commend us to God. Nothing. And once more... We always come back to this, it seems like. Once more, it's Jesus' uh, foundational beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. If a person is to come to Christ for healing and for admittance into his company, he must come to him crying, unclean, unclean, for it is only his own righteous standing before God that can bring to us the cleansing we need. He is himself the spotless Lamb of God. Nothing unclean in him. And it's necessary that we come to God begging to exchange our filth for his spotlessness. And those who do will find that he is willing, flowing out of the compassion that he has for sinners. Jesus says, I am willing, be cleansed. There may be times, there are times when it's difficult to believe that. Like a leper, we may fall into a sense of hopelessness. But Jesus is our compassionate Savior. He sympathizes with our infirmities and beckons us to draw near with confidence to his throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, Calvin, we're one of those churches, Calvin gets mentioned a lot. Calvin's commentaries, though, provide some of his most personal and insightful observations. In one of them, on, on Romans chapter 4, verse 20, uh, Calvin wrote this. Our circumstances are all in opposition to the promises of God. He promises us immortality, yet we are surrounded by mortality and corruption. He declares that he accounts us just, yet we are covered with sins. He testifies that he is propitious and benevolent toward us, yet outward signs threaten his wrath. What then are we to do? We must close our eyes, disregard ourselves, and all things connected to us so that nothing may hinder or prevent us from believing that God is true. God is true. Charles Bridges said, unbelief looks at difficulty, faith looks at promise. Here is the promise of Jesus. Whoever will come to me, I will in no wise cast out. It's the experience of every believer in him, every believer. He has told us, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The rest is the cleansing, and the cleansing is the rest. Both are symbols of the compassionate love of God for all who believe in him. We are a leper colony who have been uh, transformed by the atoning work of Christ on the cross into God's own inheritance, into the very body of Christ. How could we not but give all the glory to him, all our hearts, our thanksgivings, 
to him. We'll have a lot to be thankful for uh, this week. I trust that you will. I know I am and will. Uh, but most of all, uh, we're thankful for this, uh, that he sought us out, he touched us, he made us clean, and we, he brought us clean into his family. Let's give thanks for that. Thank you, Lord, uh, for the blessings of our salvation foremost. Uh, we're so grateful that we have a living Savior who is at your right hand, and he did not just uh, make us clean at a moment in time, but he promises to continually uh, sanctify us. And one day, uh, bring all of the company of the saints, all of the family of God into a perfect relationship with you. We look forward to that in his name. Amen.